calm uh, any anxiety, any fear that's in this place. And let your peace, let the shalom peace rest over this room right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I know that you have a plan. You have a purpose for each one that's here. And Lord, I know that as we flow in that, as we fulfill that purpose, God, there is no greater joy. And I pray that you would help and equip us, Lord, to begin to flow in the, in the things of the Spirit, to flow in your giftings, in your grace giftings, in your joy gifts, Lord, that you have for us. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So we're in a series talking, series talking about stepping into the gifts, discovering the, the spiritual gifts. We've, we've taken a, a couple weeks to really break down a foundation to have this conversation. And so this is the first week we're kind of actually going into uh, the meat, some of the meat of this. And, and, um, and if you have your Bibles or notes, they're in your bulletin. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Um, and we, we looked at verse 6 last week. 4 through 11 uh, talks about the spiritual gifts that are listed. And uh, we talked about, we basically focused on uh, verse 6 last week and talking about God's work is in all of them and all men. And it says in verse 7, Now each one has the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And he's going to list out these, these common goods, giftings. We know that the word gift in the Greek uh, actually stands for charisma. Which, uh, and, and we broke that down that the root word for charisma is, is, it goes all the way down to car, to grace, and joy is all within the word, the Greek word of charisma. And uh, it says, to the one is given the spirit of the message of wisdom, and to another the message of knowledge by the means of the same spirit. And all these, verse 11 says, all these are work of the one and the same spirit, and he gives each to each of the one just as he determines. And, and so the list that you see actually in 1 Corinthians 12 is the message of wisdom, the message of knowledge, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits or spiritual discernment, uh, the gift of tongue, and the gift of interpretation. Now, the thing that's interesting about all these, these are all measured, are measurable gifts. These are measurable things. How many knows that faith is measurable, but it's difficult to see in the natural uh, and, and there are many that, that see faith in the natural and don't understand it. Uh, but, but these gifts are very measurable. If somebody is prophesying over you, you know they're prophesying over you. If someone is, is doing a miracle, you can see that miracle unfold, right? If a person is being healed, you can measure that and say, this person was healed or delivered. So these are, these are measurable things. And, and we're going to look at them, but this morning we're just going to look at two of them. And I want to lay a foundation for these two to understand. Now these are two that are used, I believe God has in, injected these into the fellowship of the body. All of these gifts. And there's a time and place for each of them. And he says very clearly, he gives as he determines. So none of us, it's not like one of us walks around with one of these gifts. Well, I have the gift of healing, you have the gift of, uh, of miracles, you have... It, it, all of them work in all of the body simultaneously as the Lord determines. As we are available vessels, God is able to use them in us. And as we become available to Him, we can flow. Every one of us in this room has the ability to flow in all of these gifts. And that's, that's not a pipe dream, that's just a reality, because it's not something you create, it's not something you earn, it's not something you buy, it's something that God gives you as you become available, and as you become a vessel, a vessel that's, that's, that's reliable to what He wants to do. And so, I want to look at this, and so how do we interpret these gifts? I mean, we kind of see them listed here, and if you've grown up in a Pentecostal or charismatic church, you may have seen many of these gifts unfold. How many here have seen the gift of healings? Uh, somebody be healed at some point. How many here have heard somebody speaking in a gift of tongue or an interpretation? So we might have some background with some of these gifts that we can say, okay, these, these are in the body. We may not say we're seeing them to the degree that we're, we want to see them. And I believe that God is open to give them more, but I think we have to position ourselves so that he can use us. And, and the Lord can give a gift. You know, if a person hands you a gift and you don't receive it, who does the gift belong to? No, it belongs to the person that's giving the gift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think if God, I think he pours out his gift, but we're, if we're not positioned to receive those gifts, we're not going to see the manifestation <laughs> of things unfolding. 
I think what's really interesting as we look at this this morning, that Jesus flowed in these gifts. When we look at his ministry, his ministry was about these things. So let's talk about this, uh, kind of lay a foundation this morning as we talk about receiving these gifts and flowing in them in our own lives. And the first in your notes is Jesus, is Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. You know that, right? He promises that to us. In John 14, 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The, would, uh, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and you will be, and will be, you will be, and you, with you, and will be in you. I'm sorry. I'm seeing double there. Uh, and I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And so there's this idea that, that the Holy Spirit is in us. When we worship, it's in Him. When we pray, it's in us. It's something that is, is fluid. It flows. Uh, and I think, the, uh, I think many have to understand that, you know, we ask Jesus. How many here ask Jesus in your life at some point? He came into your life. With that comes the power of the Holy Spirit. And that infilling of the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and that needs to, that infilling is powerful. And it's not a thing you need for salvation, but it is definitely a free gift that is there. And so we deal with the charismatic and understanding that. In John 14, 26, Jesus continues. He says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit has been promised. Jesus says he's coming. He's going to teach you. He's going to equip you. He's going to prepare you. He will be with you always. John 16, 7, he comes back and he says, But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus says, Listen, I am leaving to go prepare a place for you, right? And as I leave, I am imparting into you the Holy Spirit. And that spirit will flow. And we see that happening within the disciples. We know in Acts chapter 2, we see this implosion as they waited in Jerusalem for God to do what he was going to do. And it says they, like tongues of fire came down on them. And all of these gifts became not only eligible in Jesus, but all of a sudden the disciples started flowing in those same gifts and ministry and mission that Jesus had. And I do not believe that God is a... It, he works for only a certain time and place. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen? Amen. And so the, all of the gifts that are in the Old Testament, all of the gifts that are in Jesus' time, are available for you and me today. It's that we've not missed the mode of a generation, but they're for His purpose. Number two, Jesus promises that we have the ability to hear His voice. That's really important. And this is an important piece. To, if you're going to flow in the gifts, you've got to be in obedience. Amen? If we're going to hear him, to flow in them, we've got to be able to hear him. In John chapter 10, verse 1, it says, I tell you the truth, a man who does not enter by the sheep pen, uh, by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the, sh his sheep, and the sheep will listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought all uh, out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Come on. We should know the voice of the Lord. Have, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody on a spiritual mode, whether they are uh, a Christian or non-Christian, and your spirit just goes, this is truth or this is a lie? That is the spirit working within you. You've heard somebody speak something and go, that's not right. Something doesn't click right. That's the Holy Spirit already. Whether you have that head knowledge or not, that Spirit is already within you going, something's not right with this. And I'll tell you, when you begin to flow in the spiritual, and flow in the gifts, they become pretty naturally flow, and they, they're not used for your purpose. You don't control them. I, I've watched people walk around thinking, I control. No, you don't. You don't control God. Amen? Amen. God is sovereign. But he allows us to come alongside of him. And as he's poured his gifts in us, and as we become willing vessels to be used, as we step into these, all of a sudden, that opportunity interaction with each other. And this really goes to what I was talking to you a couple weeks ago when I was saying, listen, the gifts, all of the gifts have to be used in the body. You can't say, I'm going to be separate. I don't need to be in church anywhere. I can do church on my own. Yes, you can. 
You can, do, you can do church on TV, but listen, the whole point is you will never be able to flow in these gifts unless they're working within the body of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean they're contained to a service on Sunday morning. And Many of you have uh, uh, church experiences outside of here. You have other groups that you're involved in, and it may be a, a Bible study, or it may be other believers with you during your workplace, and there's times where the Holy Spirit moves. These gifts move outside of a time frame. They move when you least expect them to move. They can move at a grocery store moment, amen? But here's the thing. If you've not been in the body and using those gifts and developing those gifts, you're not going to know how to use them out there. You need to have a place to actually to fail, right? We have to be in a place that we can drop a mic and be okay, right? <laughs> Even when his name is Mike, right? <laughs> So, and, and so that's really what we should be able to, to test and fail and say, you know, I'm hearing this. Is this God or not? Well, what does the Word say? And then all of a sudden go, yeah, that wasn't, but you know, this is. And I think that's where we begin to flow. And even in the area of prophecy, and we'll talk about that, you know, when God gives a prophetic gift, it, it, it is understanding how to use that, understanding the humility of what God wants to do through that, how He wants to be glorified through that, and having balance in that. Amen? <laughs> And that's really what the elders are for, is the elders need to figure this out. The elders need to flow in these gifts and they need to figure these out. Why? So that they can be equipping to the body, to helping the body move in good pasture through these things. Amen? Yeah. I mean, all of us have seen things go awry. Weird, okay? And we don't need weirdness. We need Jesus. Amen? Amen. And when Jesus is really working, there's no question it's God. Yeah. It's not us. It's God. Jesus promises that we will do even greater things than these. John 14. He says, don't, Jesus says this, John 14, 10, do, don't, don't you believe that I am the Father, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am the Father, and the Father is, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of of the miracles themselves, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these. Yeah. So Jesus already declared, not only did he promise the Holy Spirit, not only he promised that you can hear the voice of the Father in your heart, but he says, listen, you will do even greater things than what you've seen here. As Mike says, it's great the exploits that we've seen of God, but as Habakkuk says, I want to renew them in our day, chapter 3. That we want to see today his moving. And I want to tell you something. I believe God, I am convinced that God wants to pour his gifts through you in your relationships, even in your relationships with the non-believer. But I will tell you this, and I'll just, just this is a side note. If your life is not consistent with your words, you will water down the anointing and the impact and power of the gifts that God wants to use in you to reach this world for His purpose. If you are not living for Jesus when no one else is looking, you are, you are not going to see the breakthroughs you need in your own life, nor are you going to see the opportunity to be used to the Father in other people. Is that fair? Yes. Can I think about that a little bit and get back to you on that? Okay. There is. There's actually a number of them. Mike's already looking up a couple right now. So he's got my back. Pastor Bill is thinking through it. He's 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 drawing. She asked if she asked if is there a place in the Bible that says that? Yes, I yes, there's uh, that word exactly no, but it's 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 around that. I just right now I'm not, not ready to give an answer to that piece, but yes. Number four, Jesus modeled these gifts in his ministry. Now, this is important to understand. I mean, it's good, if you're going to learn something, it's good to see it in action, right? It's like if I'm, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I see that I do, right? I hear, I see, I do. And uh, to be able to see, that's how you do it. That's what, I think YouTube has become so phenomenal for the do-it-yourself service. Yeah. You know, you need to do brain surgery, just turn on YouTube, you know. You just walk through the procedure, you know. 
you know, it's, if, if you can see an action, you can do it, right? Most people, their cars. I, you know, I, I'm at the point now where I got my, my, my iPad out when I'm getting ready to work on my car and looking at the YouTube with that model and figuring out, okay, that's what he means when he said that, you know, and see it. Because it, it helped. And, and to be able to model, Jesus modeled it. I think what's, what's so wonderful is what Jesus was doing in a hostile world that didn't know who he was he was modeling for the church that he was establishing. He was actually preparing the church to be the church just by them walking around with him and seeing his works in action. Today we're going to look at basically two of these gifts, the message or word of wisdom and message or word of knowledge that we see listed in verse 8 of chapter 12. And uh, it is important, as I go into this this morning, to note that these two gifts definitely work in conjunction with others. In other words, for these gifts to happen you need the other gifts to be in effect. For instance, the gift of faith to even trust what God's saying, right? Uh, you need to have the gift of healing, prophecy, those things are there. So the first that we see is the word of wisdom or the, the message of wisdom. And, and so he says, he says, to some will be the word of wisdom or the message of wisdom. Now this is spiritual understanding for an eternal purpose. It really is, it's divine understanding, okay? So let me just kind of give a definition. The, to, to walk in a message of wisdom or a word of wisdom means you ultimately have, in that moment, a divine understanding of applying knowledge. Now, understand, knowledge in itself is great, but it's worthless. Because knowledge isn't going to get you anywhere. We live in a culture that really, our, the idolatry I know of our county, I believe, is politics and knowledge. Th those are the two gods of Kitsap County. Uh, there, there is so much, we have so much that it's the religions of this county are politics and knowledge. If people, if we just have enough knowledge, that'll be the answer to everything. I want to tell you something, knowledge without wisdom is worthless. It's dangerous. Think about nuclear weapons. Just because a country has the knowledge doesn't mean they have the wisdom. And, and so when it talks about a message of the wisdom from the Spirit coming, it's a divine understanding of applying knowledge, seeing life from God's perspective. It's in that moment, in that circumstance, it's seeing it what God sees in that moment or circumstances. And it's being led of the Holy Spirit to act appropriately in a given set of circumstances or supernatural impartation of facts. So let me give you a couple examples in the Old Testament of this. And... Uh, in, in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings, you don't have this. Actually, what I'm going to give you, you don't have any notes, but you can write this in. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 25, is a story of Solomon, King Solomon. Now, how many remember when Solomon was a young boy, and he was being commissioned to be king? He, he, the Lord asked him, what would, anything you want, I'll give you. And he said, I wanted wisdom. And because he asked, he asked for wisdom, God was so amazed by that. God says, now I'm going to make you wisdom, I'm going to make you wealthy, I'm going to make you all this other thing. And so one day he was, he was as a king judging, and there were these two women, and it was during a time that was difficult, and there was famine that had been in the land, and uh, the one gal had a baby, and uh, the other gal had a baby, and her baby died in the middle of the night. And so she wakes up the next morning, and the gal that had the baby that didn't die, her baby's not next to her anymore. The other gal that lost her baby decided that she was just going to take her baby, Right? And so now there's this argument, whose baby is this? They didn't have the DNA test back in those days. You know, I'm talking about getting switched at birth, right? And, 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 and whose baby is this? And so this becomes such an incredible controversy. No, none of the magistrates know what to do with it. So they keep sending it up the line, up the line. And all of a sudden it gets, it gets heard before the supreme king of King Solomon. And you've got these two mothers there, and they're fighting for this baby. And the one mother says, this is my baby, this is what happened, she took her, she took, her baby died and she took it away from me. And the other, baby, the other gal says, she's a liar, the baby that died was her baby, this is my baby, why is she trying to take my baby? Can you see the problem here? Now this is a moment that natural wisdom, natural knowledge isn't enough. So what, is, what does King Solomon do? He has this great plan, he just looks at him and says, I got, a, I got an idea. He calls one of his guards over and he says, I want you to grab your sword and take the baby. And they took the baby. He says, now what I want you to do is cut the baby in half and give them each half of the baby. The mothers whose baby had died kind of sat back and said, that's a good idea. The one that was her baby says, no, give her the baby. I don't want you to harm my baby. Solomon goes, ah, 
I know who the mother is. See, that was divine wisdom in a situation. I always thought it was pretty cool, divine wisdom. Pretty scary if you'd gone through with it, but pretty cool when divine wisdom was there. In Luke chapter 20, we see Jesus had dealt with a uh, word of wisdom that came upon him, the religious leaders. Many times they came to stump him. Many times they came and they, if they could just catch him in, in a way. And it was one of those things where if you give a, a right or wrong answer, or if you give an answer, there's no right answer to it. Right. And so they come to him and he's, in front of his, he's teaching in front of his people. They always did it publicly. He'd be in front of him, he'd be teaching, and also the religious leaders would say, hey, excuse me, excuse me, I have a question for you. And the question they asked this one day in Luke chapter 20 is, is they say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now those were very controversial words coming from the crowd because he, he was teaching a crowd of people who wanted to get out from underneath Rome, hated Caesar, hated the Romans, because the Romans had so caused them grief. I mean, do you know a Roman soldier had the right, if he saw you as a Jew, he could make you carry all of his equipment for at least one mile, yes. without question. It didn't matter what you were doing. You could be in the middle of a funeral, and you'd have to carry it. Otherwise, he could either kill you or put you in prison. And they, they, they were so taken advantage of by the Romans. And so this idea, so if Jesus said, yes, it's lawful to pay your taxes to Caesar, the people would be angry because they're, they're hoping, many of them were zealots, hoping that he was there to overcome Rome. And so they would have, it would have, they would have walked away from him. The others, if he said, no, it's, it's, it's not lawful, they, the, the religious leaders could have got the authorities and said, he's, he's in rebellion, and they could have drug Jesus away. How does he answer that? And I love, I love his answer. His answer says, would you hand me a coin? And he hands him a coin. He says, whose face is on the front of this coin? It said Caesar. He says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. That was wisdom. That was, a, that was a spirit of wisdom that had come down, a message of wisdom immediately in that circumstance to give the right answer. Yeah. Acts chapter 6, we see a problem with the, uh, the, the, the people I, my, they start with an H, but I can't remember. Hellenists, I think it was the Hellenists. Hellenists were, were not being taken care of. There was some, there were, believe it or not, in the New Testament, there was some discrimination going on. No, the Jews wouldn't discriminate, would they? Yeah. And so, uh, and, there was, and they were feeling a little left out. They didn't have there, and so they were trying to figure out what to do because the apostles were trying to, you know, they were seeking God, and they were praying, and they were trying to teach, and they were trying to follow, they didn't know what to do. And so they prayed, and the Holy Spirit gave them a word of wisdom as a collective, as, as a church, and says, you need to appoint seven elders or deacons to do the work of the ministry, to meet the needs of the people. Again, that was a message of wisdom that God gave and said, this is the way we need to go. Let's walk in it. Is it, is it coming clear on what the word of wisdom is? And that message is something God wants to use in your own life, in your own situation. How many here have ever prayed for direction in your life? You need a message, you need a word of wisdom in that situation. And God wants to, to do that. In James 1.5, James says this, If any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives it generously to all without funding fault. And it will be given, in, uh, and it will be given to him. We know that in Luke chapter twelve, verse eleven, this is uh, Jesus said, said this. He says, "When you are brought before the synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say." That's that's the message of wisdom. You know what to say at that moment. We saw that in Paul's ministry as he went to, as he as he appealed to Caesar and the emperor to Rome. And, and stood before the magistrates, Augustus, and so on. And so that's the word of wisdom, message of wisdom. That is a gifting that comes, not be, you don't control it, but it's in a moment when you are prayerful in any situation. When, a, when something comes, a conflict comes, or there's a difficulty, and you step back instead of do the knee-jerk reaction, you say, okay, Lord, what do I do right now? And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, boom. And it's the right, it's the right answer. It'll come. It just flows. It feels like it's there. I can't tell you how many times I've been counseling people, and they've they come with a situation, and all of a sudden I'm giving answers, and I'm wanting to take notes because the word that's coming out isn't coming from me. It's the Lord is getting. It's a great word, and people look at me, Pastor, you're really wise. I'm like, No, that wasn't me. That's the Holy Spirit. He's just right in this moment. It's a God moment right now, and He's giving direction. And, and why does he do that? For his purpose. And as we're, as we're listening to his presence, as we're understanding his, his under, recognizing his voice in our lives, and just beginning to flow in that. Say, so, you know what? I see this situation, and I see this. Seems. Now, all, how many know wisdom of God is always going to be in alignment with his word? 
It's going to come out of His Word. And many that are, actually, the more you know the Word, the more you're going to flow in that gift. Because God is going to bring that back and He's going to bring that in that moment to encourage you. The second is the word of knowledge. Now, we're, and, and the word of knowledge is a little different than the word of message or the message of, of, of wisdom. And it's a message of knowledge. This one is a little bit more... Woo-woo! Okay, you know, little, it gets attention a little bit more. Because, you know, the word of wisdom, you say, well, that was a really wise thing you just said. Praise God, you know. And, 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 uh, and, and we, we even saw that with, with Peter, remember? Uh, oh, well, we'll get to Peter in a second. So, the, but a message of knowledge or a word of knowledge is a little bit more direct. And that's a little bit more definable because when it happens, it's like, whoa, what just happened? And that's where the Holy Spirit begins to move to bring order in the midst of things. And so, so you say, well, what is the, the word of knowledge? Is a spiritual insight for an eternal purpose. It's something that God gives you that you may not in yourself, in your own knowledge, know, but the Holy Spirit reveals knowledge to you for His purpose. And that's and there are times I've been on the streets. There are times that I've walked up to people and said, "Let's say I want you to go talk to this person because this is what just happened to them, and I wasn't there." Remember when Jesus walked up to Philip and he says, I saw you under a, a tree? And Philip was amazed. That was a word of knowledge. It's like you were sitting under a tree waiting for this moment. And he was amazed. And he followed Jesus because of that, right? Was that Philip? Yeah, it was Philip. So, so the word of knowledge. We see in John chapter 4, we see in the story of Jesus, we see in the story of Jesus and the, uh, the woman at the well. Do you, how many know that story? The woman at the well. She's a Samaritan woman, and Jesus walks up to her, and he asks for a drink, and pretty soon he's unfolding ministry. And all of a sudden, he looks at her, and he says, she says, I, she, she says well, why don't you go get your husband and bring him back? And she says, she says, uh, she says I don't have a husband. And he, and he looks at her in the word of knowledge. He says, huh, I know you don't have a husband. In fact, the man, you know, you've had seven, and the one you're with now is not your husband. And she's like, whoa, there's a prophet. How did you know that? You know, she read your mail. Anybody ever heard that term, somebody read my mail? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's a word of knowledge can be. They read it just boom. And it's just unfolding. And um, I, I was mentioned a few weeks ago, that's a part of the reason my wife became my wife is because of the word of knowledge. Uh, she dumped me in college. I remember I shared that story a few weeks ago. She dumped me, and we were going to take a walk, and the Holy Spirit in the middle of that walk said no, and all of a sudden for a half hour I began to talk to her about her childhood stuff I did not know. It just unfolded, and she just began to break, and I was pretty sh shook up too because I didn't know where this stuff was coming from. I'm like, how did I know that? I didn't know that. Well, well, really, I was reacting to what I was sharing. And, uh, and, and, and I think those are times when the Lord, for His purpose in being... Uh, can give that and can pour into it. Matthew chapter 16, uh, Peter's revelation. Remember, Jesus asked his disciples, "Who do you say? Who do men say that I am?" And they said, "Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're this, that, and the other." He says, "Who do you say that I am?" And Peter pops up. A word of wisdom comes, or a word of knowledge comes into him, and he says, "You are the Son of God, the Living Christ. You are the Messiah. You are. You're the one." And Jesus says to him, "It is not by learned. It is not by earned." And it is not by purchase that you know that. It's only because my Father has made it known to you. That was a word of knowledge. Just to reveal, boom, this is what needs to be known in this moment. And, um, and that's important. Acts chapter 3, we see Peter again in chapter 3 of, of Acts. Him and John are heading to the temple to go worship the Lord. They've been, where they've been going every day. And all of a sudden this day, there's a beggar standing on the side of the road. I don't know how many times he passed him. We don't know. We know that they may have passed him every day for a month. Maybe a year. But this day, this day, God spoke to Peter. There was a word of knowledge that came upon Peter. And I think that's what missed in this conversation. How many know the story uh, of the beggar? That's the word. It was the word. God had already, I would even post to you this. God had already done what he was going to do. Amen. At the moment God spoke to Peter, he had already done what he was going to do to that beggar. That beggar was already healed. He just didn't know it. It wasn't that Peter walked up and he was healed. He was already healed. And he walks up, and, he, and he's looking at him, and the beggar's all excited, and he says, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. He, he, we, all Peter was there for was to let him know what God had already done. Peter was just, a, I just wanted to let you know, did you know that you've been healed? That's all that was. But I think people see that story now, oh man, Peter grabbed him and healing came. No, it was already in place. But the word of knowledge 
was what Peter was walking in. And God got the glory, not Peter. Amen? Uh, Acts chapter 5. This is probably the more scary one in Scripture. Is uh, Ananias and Sapphira. This is good right before Halloween. Uh, if you know the story, Barnabas had sold a great piece of land, and he gave all of the proceeds of that to the church. And, uh, and there's reasons why we could break that down. Uh, in that time period, what was going on, there was much discipleship. Many were getting saved, and they were needing uh, to take care of them because they weren't home. They were getting discipled away from home. And, uh, and so he, uh, Barnabas had given all that was there. And Ananias and Sapphira, this husband and wife team that saw this, thought this was great. They, had a, they, they were as wealthy as, as Barnabas, so they went out and sold their piece of land. But they decided they wanted to put away some retirement, which there was nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong. If it's your land, it's yours, right? Right. right. Uh, and there was nothing wrong with what they did. They could have sold that land and kept all of the money, and it would have been no further the problem. But they lied to the Holy Spirit. Yes. They went before the church and said, we're giving all of our proceeds to look at us. We want the same praise that Barnabas is getting. It was selfish. And it had nothing to do, because they could have kept all of it. I mean, Paul, but didn't God tell through Nathan, God told David, David, if I hadn't given you enough when David Bathsheba and he fell, I'd have given you even more, right? I mean, God's not, a, he's not stingy, he's generous. But they wanted, they, they lied to the Holy Spirit and the Lord told Peter and Peter had knowledge and he confronted Ananias. Ananias. He says, Ananias, he says, did you give all of the money? That, not because he had to give it, because he claimed that he gave it. Right. Gave him a chance. I mean, right there, Ananias could say, you know what, Peter, you're right. We, we, we had retirement set apart. And Peter would say, now, you know, you realize. It could have been a teaching moment for Ananias. Instead, it was a life and death moment for Ananias. Because he says, did you give all of you the proceeds? Because that's what they had claimed to the church. That's what they had brought before the church. And, and at that moment, Peter was not speaking to Ananias alone. It was the Holy Spirit through Peter that was speaking to him. And when Ananias said, yes, we gave everything, that's when he lied. And he, and he died. He fell dead. And it says the guys came in. I mean, that's a pretty, like, whoa. And they're bagging him up and they're carrying him out. No sooner get him out, his wife, Sapphira, that didn't know what happened, walks into the room. And Peter again looks at her, and she had an opportunity. She could have, at that point, she could have came clean and said, "You know what?" But she said the same thing. No, we. Gave, they kept their stories together. No, we gave. And he says, "You are going to die just like your husband, right where he lay. You lay." Boom. Now Peter didn't kill them, uh, and it had nothing to do with Peter. Peter again was walking in the word of knowledge. Now that's pretty heavy, right? Whoa. And uh, and and I think that every opportunity, but they had chosen. To, to lie to the Holy Spirit in that moment. And that's where we, we walk in the light, not in darkness. Amen? Amen. My, uh, my uncle, uh, Larry, um, is a pastor down in Chehalis. And I, you've, some of you remember him. We've had him here. Oh, yeah. And uh, I get a lot of people asking me, well, bring him back. Bring him back. Um, I, he, I could go on for hours of stories of his, just amazing what God does through him. And he runs and flows the gifts. But one that really caught my attention according to this word of knowledge thing uh, I thought was interesting. A number of years ago, a young Mormon couple, their son had an enlarged liver and was told by the doctor they could do nothing they could do. He was two years old and he was going to die. And uh, they were pretty desperate. And through uh, some people, they had heard that my uncle prayed for people and that people would find healing. And they were, and you know, when you become desperate, you'll do anything. And so they drove from Seattle down to Centralia, Chehalis area, and went to my uncle's church and said, hey, listen, um, will you pray for our baby? And somewhere in there, my uncle knew they were Mormon or I don't know, but a word of knowledge came over him and he said something and it was kind of crazy. And some people say, well, that's kind of a harsh thing to say. But it wasn't him. It was the Lord just said, this is it. And I don't think he knew they were Mormon. I think they just showed up and said, hey, will you pray for our baby? And he looked at him in a word of knowledge and said, you leave the Jesus of the Mormon church and you accept the Jesus of the Judeo-Christian church and God will heal your baby. And they said, absolutely not. And they left. They left offended and they left. About a month, I don't know, it was a couple weeks or a month later, um, their baby had become very very sick and was going to die and out of desperation they came back God had worked in their hearts for that, that period of time they're gone and they came back and they repented and said we will denounce Mormon and Jesus and we will take on the Jesus of Judeo Christian faith and God healed their baby they became his youth pastors <laughs> in time and so um, and that was a word of knowledge that had come down 
And uh, the God, so God can like give for those purposes and those moments. Say, doom, this is what you need to hear. This is what needs to be said. So Jesus modeled these gifts in the situation, uh, really probably, and I want to just close out this morning with this story uh, of John chapter 8. And I want to read this real quick and break this down to you. This, all of that to bring you to this. and to, Because both of these gifts are flowed in this story of John chapter 8. Uh, verses 1 through 11. And let me just read this to you and then I'll break this down and, uh, and we'll, we'll take this home this morning. We're, we're, we're on our way. We're, we're, we made the bend. Okay? We're heading back. Okay? John chapter 8, verse 1 says, But Jesus went to Mount, the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teacher of the law and of the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of idolatry. And the law of Moses commanded us, commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question to trap him in, uh, to trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bit it down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he, strength, he straightened up and he said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left and with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. So let me bring this home and just kind of, let's, let's go there for a moment. If you can bear the picture of what this really looked like. So Jesus had in the morning he goes and he goes he goes and he gets away and he gets alone. He was modeling this point that need to get alone. We'll talk about that in a second. He comes down to spend his days in the temple courts and he is teaching. And, and who's there? I mean, there are religious, there are religious leaders there. There are, there are very the wealthy, the poor. I mean, they're all there. This is a this is a public thing. This is like a, a, a this is like a Billy Graham crusade you know, brought down, you know. And, and he's teaching. He's unfolding this great truths. And this woman is caught in bed. Most likely, many theologians believe with another religious leader. Okay, uh, the mistress of a religious leader. That's there's a, there's a lot of potential with that. And the reason why that's brought up is because if it wasn't a religious leader, the man would have been brought too. But uh, for some reason, the man got away with it. So there was corruption in the, in the, in the realm. So their friend had, it's assumed, one of the assumptions, and we don't know that for sure. But now, and you need to know that she was caught in the act, which means she had no clothes on. So they're dragging her by her hair, naked, through the streets, and they're heading to the gate to go out to the place to where they stone you because the law commanded it. And they've caught her in bed, and they, they probably they're trying, to, maybe they're doing an intervention with their, their, their brother that shouldn't have been doing this at that moment. I don't know, but they caught her, and they're dragging her out. And as they're dragging her out, they notice a crowd. And they see a crowd, and they realize that Jesus is out there teaching, and thinking, oh, this is a perfect opportunity. So they drag her up through the crowd, and they interrupt what Jesus is doing, and they throw her down at his feet, naked, bleeding, pretty much beat up. And they throw an accusation at him that they again are trying to trap him. Right. What should we do with her? Knowing that he teaches love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. Right. And if he says, if he says stone her, that's going to, again, be a problem with the crowd, right? And if he says, don't stone her, then they can go stone him too, because he's in cahoots now. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's kind of in a, another catch-22. Aren't you glad for the, the word of wisdom and, and, you know, that can come in those moments? And, uh, and so Jesus looks at him, and, he, and, and I love it. He looks at him, and he bends down, and he starts writing in the sand. Now, people don't, you know, he's doodling in the sand. Many think that he's writing the names of their mistresses. Okay, that's probably one of the most common, uh, the common interpretations is that he was actually writing, you know, Melissa, Jody, Sarah, Jackie, you know, not that anybody here, I'm not, I don't mean that bad, okay, but just kind of writing, writing in the sand, okay, and, and they're noticing those names, and going, whoa, okay, and he stands up and he says, I'll tell you what, he who here has no sin, why don't you be the first one to cast a stone? And he bends down and he continues to write. Jody was with, <laughs> you know, whatever it was. And they're like one by one, I'm getting out of here. And they're gone. 
Okay? So let me, let's break this down here for a moment. First of all, that I want to grab, when we're talking about if we're going to flow in the gifts, how many know we should model what Jesus did? And the first thing in the story he did is he had been with the Father. It says he was at the Mount of Olives, the place in prayer. It was, it was his place for prayer and devotion. Remember, that was where he spent the night before he was crucified as well. It was his favorite place. He had his happy place with God, was alone. He would go and spend time alone. And I, he was tuned in to the Father's voice. I want to tell you something. If you want to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, you've got to be tuned into the Spirit. Right. If you're not taking time in your day, if you're not setting aside a time to spend time with God, you're not going to be able to hear what he has to say. Because this world is loud. And this world is boisterous, and, it's, and, and, and circumstances are going to cloud in, and they're going to keep you from hearing that voice in your life. Because Jesus isn't going to force that voice, it's a still, small, sweet voice. But he was tuned in to the Father. That's huge. Before this ever it was in, he had spent time, he modeled being tuned in. If you want to flow in the gifts, you've got to be tuned in with the Father. If you're coming to church on Sunday morning and you're barely getting here, you barely got up in time to get here and you've not taken time with God, you are robbing God for what he wants to do in your life. Because if you've not spent time with the Father before you come to church, how do you know what the Father is saying? You can't hear him if you're not tuned in to him. If you show up at a prayer meeting, a corporate prayer meeting, and you've not prayed before that meeting, you have robbed God. Because how are you going to know how to pray if you're not tuned into what the... Are you hearing what I'm saying here? Yes. So Jesus was tuned in to the Father, and it was in there because he would spent time with him in that morning. Number two is he was willing, verse two, he was willing to give of himself. Freely get, receive, freely give. Verse two, it says he was teaching, he was giving of himself to the people there. And I'll tell you, that's the other piece. If you are not going to be used in the, in the Spirit, if you're not willing to give of yourself, if you're not willing to be laid out for those around you, you're not going to have any... Because it doesn't matter what God's given, it's not going to go anywhere. You're going to hoard it. You know what I'm saying? But when you freely give what is there, now you're giving opportunity for the Spirit to move through you. Number three is he did not react to the urgent circumstances. And I will tell you, that would have been real easy to react in those moments. How many know sometimes when the sky is falling, that's the time to run for cover, right? Yeah. But he, he didn't react. It says, even though he, there was accusation from the religious leaders, was double-edged on that point, if you let her go or, 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 or not, he, you, he did not respond in fear. You cannot respond in fear. Yeah, these are not on your notes. I'm sorry. Okay. He, can, he did not respond in fear and, and, and cri of, or crisis that was there. He immediately responded. He didn't react. And I think that's huge. And I think if we get in react mode, that means we're all emotional. You're not hearing God in that moment either. How I many you know the moment the sky is falling, you can't hear anything? Have you ever heard a person that's in great fear or distress and you're trying to get their attention all of a sudden you see them like, slap them just to wake them up, say, not that they wanted to hurt them, but needed to break whatever mode they were in. And I think that's, that's one of those things, uh, that's one of those things where we've got to be at a point to where we can respond to what God's doing, not simply react to what, he's, to what the world is doing around us. Um, number, f I think it's four, yes. is Jesus used the message or the gift of knowledge, uh, used in, in verse six. We see this kind of, the gift of message and the gift of knowledge unfolded in verse 6, when he built down in the sand, he began to write in the sand, uh, potentially the names of those that were that were there, of the mistresses that was there. Whatever he wrote in the sand got their attention, and that was a word of knowledge at that point. Because that was the point where he's writing stuff that he shouldn't know because he wasn't there, but he's God, right? But he's modeling to us that spiritual, that spiritual moving in that moment of writing in the sand. And I think that was, uh, I think what's interesting about that is those there, there was a lot of mercy in that. Because, I, you know, at that moment, Jesus could have walked up to Butch and said, Butch, you know, you got this gal, but what about Susie Q, you know? Or Diana, right? And they're like, whoa! But he didn't do that. He just wrote the sand so that there was no direction. Only the person that had whatever it was had to deal with that in their heart. He didn't throw them out under the bus. There's a lot of mercy in that. And, uh, but that, I think that's probably why he chose to rub the sand, to let them deal with it in their own hearts. Uh, we don't know the backstory of what happened after that with many of them. Number five uh, is Jesus used the message of wisdom in verse seven. And when he said this, he who is without sin cast the first stone. 
That was, a, that was the perfect answer to the question that they asked. And so, you know, we, we're told, really important, we're told to, uh, to test the gifts of the Spirit. First John, John tells us in First John 4, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. Just because somebody claims they're of God, and we'll talk more about prophecy, and I, I'll just say this to you just in, in, in note, God is never going to be speak to me about you if he hasn't spoke to you first. Amen. That's really important. If a person comes and says, I have a prophetic word from the Lord, that's great, receive it, file it away. But if God has not spoken to you first, then it doesn't mean it's not God, it just means you need to put it aside. But you do not take in a prophecy that God has not spoken to you. And, and so, you know, God told you to go to Africa. I know we had a church I was in, and, and there were two people at the altar, and the, the evangelist said, God said that you're supposed to get married. And it caused massive hysteria. Because God hadn't told them that. And so, and so I think sometimes when you get kind of weird with prophecy, and I think there's balance there. We, we test the Spirit. We test those things. Man, I'm sensing this is what God is saying. Nope. Okay, well then put that aside. Yep, that is. Okay, now I know. Okay, that was God. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. We kind of work that out there. We test. It says the result of these gifts will always build up the body and the believer. And that's something you need to also know. God will never use these gifts to bring condemnation in someone's life. Even if they're addressing sin, it will never be in condemnation. It will always be in conviction of hope, of righteousness. God is never in Jesus. I think that's why he wrote in the sand. He wasn't there to, con right. to condemn. He was there to convict. And conviction is always to righteousness. It's never condemnation. The word condemns, or the law condemns, not the word, but the law condemns. But grace is there to bring us, lead us towards righteousness. Amen? Yeah. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.10, I know we've been saying this verse a lot. Uh, he, says, he says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully in ministry of God's grace, God's grace in its various forms. And he also says that we're to speak as though you are speaking the very words of God. And so I think that's just, we need to be as seriously understand that these gifts are God's, they're not ours, and we need to be careful with them. Amen? And, uh, and use those in, inappropriately. So that I just leave with you, that is, that is kind of my, my hit, one-two punch with those two. We're going to continue this as we kind of break through the next few weeks on the gifts of Spirit. But my heart and desire is that each one here will begin to, Desire the gifts and desire to flow in them and ask yourselves in these difficult situations What's the Lord speaking here? What is he saying and let God speak through you even into, into your own life? Let God speak into you. Amen. Yeah. Amen